Welcome to Across the Universe, a series where we'll meet local people who are pursuing their passions and making an impact on the world around them. Our guest today is Peter A. Barker, originally of Haverhill, Mass., now living in Los Angeles, and he's a music producer and mixer. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. So tell us a little bit about your life story. How did you get from here in Haverhill out to L.A.? Well, um, you know, I grew up in Haverhill, went to Haverhill High School, St. Joseph School, Grammar School, and uh, I had a fascination with music, and I started playing guitar when I was 10 years old. Um, I took lessons from a, a pretty legendary uh, Haverhill resident, Ed Loopy, who taught, you know, many people in the city. And um, then I started taking lessons at the Haverhill Music Center, and um, I got in my first professional band when I was 16, and we, we were a wedding band, and we used to play weddings. And it, it was really exciting to be 16 years old, you know, and to be able to go out and, and make money. Oh, yeah, it must have been incredible. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I just loved it. And then I, I was in a couple rock bands. Um, one of them was called Floyd Ladd. We used to play on the North Shore. And then another one was a Havel band called Eye of the Storm, or ETS. Um, we actually had a little minor hit uh, in, the, in the early 80s called March of the Gypsy Moth. Uh, and that was really exciting for me because I remember driving down to the Cape one Saturday and, and my song came on WBCN. And it was oh, like wow. so exciting, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, that must have been yeah. amazing. Yeah. And um, at one point we did a project at a studio down in Revere called Euphoria Sound. And... Um, there was a problem with the, uh, with the mixing console, and the guy that was recording us got out a soldering iron and went under the console and started fixing it. And, and, and something went off in my head that, like, a, wow, a real recording engineer not only knows how to record stuff, but knows how to fix things. Got into uh, electronics training and, and learned electronics, and I had a good fundamental music background, and I... I thought those would be really good fundamental skills that would benefit me going forward. In 1984, my, the band broke up, and I, I realized that I was, you know, 24 years old, and maybe the, the band thing wasn't going to work out. So I decided that I wanted to become a recording engineer and producer. And I realized that if I was going to do it at the highest level, I needed to either move to New York or Los Angeles. And I'd been to L.A. and I really loved the weather, so that's what I did. I loaded up my van with my guitars, my tape recorders, my furniture, and I moved to L.A. Wow. Yeah. That's taking a pretty big risk. Yeah, but, but you know, I, I realized I had a lot of fundamental skills that I thought would benefit me, and, and, and they did. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I got to L.A., I immediately got a job with a company called Quad 8 and they made mixing consoles. So I was working on mixing consoles all day, and then I was going to recording school at night. And, uh, you know, I, I often tell kids when they're starting out in their career that what you learn on the job is, is, is sometimes worth more than what you get paid. And, oh, yeah. you know, that's what happened to me. I was, I was working with one of the best design engineers in the world, and, it was like I was going to school every day and then going to school at night. So it was this accelerated training and job I had at the same time. And um, so Quad 8 went into bankruptcy. And then um, all my friends who worked for the company were just collecting unemployment. And they were, you know, just waiting, you know, yep. just, you know, partying, drinking you know, having a good time. And I was like, you know what? I, I came to LA to work in a studio. I'm gonna just pick up the phone and start calling studios. So I started calling studios asking for work for an engineering job and I couldn't get the time of day. So then I was like, man, what, what, what do I have to do? And I thought, well, maybe, maybe, <coughs> maybe they need someone to fix the equipment. So I started calling studios and saying, hey, do you need a maintenance engineer? And they were, it was like, oh, wait one minute, I'll let you talk to the studio manager. So the, the light bulb went off, and I had several interviews, and uh, I went to work for a company called Kendon, which at one time was the largest independent recording studio in the world. But interestingly enough, they were going through bankruptcy as well. 
And um, so I helped close that studio down. And the guy that was running it said to me, he said, hey, I have this other studio in Hollywood called Artisan Sound. And I think you'd be the perfect guy to be my chief engineer. So help me close this down, and then you'll come down there and be my chief engineer. So I said, great. So that was about two months to close Kendon down, and then I went to work at Artisan. And I like to tell people I went right from recording school to chief engineer, which is a true story. Um, so what was unique about me is this was a small studio, so I could do the assistant engineering, I could do the maintenance, and I could engineer if need be. So basically with one person, he covered three jobs. So it was a real win-win for him and, mm -hmm. for, and for me. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for about four years. I worked with um, Joni Mitchell, Tommy Shaw, Gene Simmons from KISS, Morris Day, the Brothers Johnson. And then we also had a mastering uh, room there. Um, mastering is where you press the vinyl records. Mm -hmm. And we did um, Peter Gabriel So. Uh, White Snake, all the Geffen Aerosmith releases from the 80s. So it was a pretty exciting place to be. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, within a short time, you know, I, I wanted to go to LA to work at the highest level. And within a little more than a year, I was right there, right where I wanted to be. And, uh, That's an amazing story. And there's so many people who, you know, it's a very competitive industry. Yeah. So there's so many people who go out there, get started, but it sounds like you took a lot of initiative on your own, kind of. And yeah, I really believe in fundamental yeah. training. Um, like, one of the things I see now is a lot of kids wanting to get into the trade, mm -hmm. but not having a high level of musical acuity, mm -hmm. which I think is so wrong. You have to understand pitch, you have to understand the different keys, the tempos, uh, you know, meter, all of those things. You really have to understand that. So I had that knowledge, plus I had the electronics. So I had these great fundamental skills that were building blocks that I could build my career on. So I would, I would recommend anybody who wants to be in my trade to, to get those fundamental skills. Like I see all these recording schools now, and they, you know, you know they're going to teach kids how to run a mixing console. Well. You know, I don't really care about that. I want to know, do you understand what's going on underneath that mixing console? Mm -hmm. Do you understand, you know, the music that's coming from that studio that's going through that mixing console? I think you're better off going to community college, getting your music theory, getting your, your harmony, your composition, and get those building blocks under you before you move on to the, you know, being a recording engineer. The light bulb went off for me when I was in that small studio in Revere and, and something happened with the equipment and the guy plugged in his soldering iron, he got under the board and he, you know, he fixed a wire that was broken yep. and I realized, whoa, this is, you know, this is like what a real recording engineer does. So who are some of the artists that you're working with today? Well, this year, this year I'm doing a lot of consulting, I'm helping people build studios. Um, right now I'm working with Jim Carrey. The, uh, the actor, he just bought a building in Santa Monica and I'm helping him put his studio together. I worked with him last year on a project and we really hit it off. And so he told his people that, you know, I want this guy to help me build my studio. Um, and then I'm also working with a, a label called Cherry Party and they're a Sony label and I'm helping them put their studio together. Uh, last year, <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Last year I did a lot of mixing work. Uh, I, I do a lot of live DVDs, so I mixed, let's see, I started the year mixing Bocelli, his Love and Portofino DVD and mm -hmm. TV special. I did the 5.1, the surround sound on that. And then I did, um, I did Ronnie James Dio from 1986, the Philadelphia Spectrum. So what we do there is we get the, we got the tapes that were recorded in 1986. We restore them, we transfer them to digital, then we mix them in stereo and 5.1 surround and um, you know, make, make a show. And, and that was a pretty exciting show because that was like at the height of Dio's popularity. And uh, it was the Philadelphia Spectrum, it was sold out, the crowd was electric, 
And, you know, he had his big dragons and all his stage effects. And uh, we also transferred the film on that show. It was shot in 16 millimeter. We transfer the film, and then what we do is we go in and we, we restore the film. We take all the noise out. We make it look real pretty. I do the same thing with the audio. And uh, that was an exciting project to work on. Uh, so I did that. I mixed Megadeth. I mixed uh, Black Label Society, that Zach Wilde band. I did uh, Black Sabbath um, DVD last year. And then um, I finished up the year by mixing Hearts uh, Christmas special. It was on Christmas night on AXS, <coughs> which is actually, that's going to come out on DVD uh, later this year. So late, later this year, that'll be a project that, I, that I'm working on. That's amazing, and it's so interesting that you're able to go back and engineer these events from 1986 or even maybe longer ago. Have you done other projects like that? Uh, yeah. Um, man, there's been, there's been so many. Um, i trying to... Just trying to rack my brain for mm -hmm. the past few years. Um, uh, I've done a lot of restoration work. Mm -hmm. What's What's interesting about my generation is, you know, when I came to LA, I I was involved in the pinnacle of analog technology w with uh, 24 track analog tape machines. Right. And we used to we used to lock multi machines together with a synchronizer, so we could have two 24 tracks running together and uh, they would be synchronized so we could have a total of 46 audio tracks. And, and that was just incredible. You know, so I saw, I saw the pinnacle of analog and I, I was well versed in it, mm -hmm. I understood it, mm -hmm. and, and the, but, but I was still young when computers came in. So I embraced computers. I, had, I bought my first Macintosh when I was 25. So now what's really cool is, is is if we need to go back to 1986, I'm I'm right at home. Whereas some of the uh, some of the younger, you know, people that are coming up, they they don't really understand that world. So my my generation is very fortunate in that we we can straddle both worlds. We can be experts in the digital world. We can be experts in the analog world. So uh, very fortunate. That's awesome. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So what's your favorite aspect of working in the music industry? I'm sure it's very stressful, a lot of hours, but there's got to be a lot of fun stuff to it, too. Uh, I think the, best, the funnest thing you can do, I think, is the creation process. Um, songwriting and publishing demos. Because when you do that, you're, you start off the day with nothing, and by the end of the day, you have a, you have a song that's been written and completed. Uh, so that's, that's very exciting. I, I often tell people that the, the first 80% of the job will take 20% of the time, you know, and, and the last 20% the last will take 80% of the time and cost 80% of the money. So when you're, <clears throat> when you're creating a song from scratch with a group of writers or a group of people, that's, that's very exciting because you, you basically create that first 80% in one day. So what advice would you give to a youngster who's maybe watching, interested in getting to music production? No, like you said, it's good to have a background in music theory, first of all. Oh, yeah. Big. If you want to be in the music business, understand music. It's, I, I can't stress how important that is. Play an instrument. Uh, play multiple instruments. You know, because now, more of the work is being done by fewer of the, pe fewer mm -hmm. of the people. Mm -hmm. So... Back when I started, if you were making a record, you had an arranger, you had a producer, you had an engineer, an assistant engineer, you had a musicians, um, you had a copyist, you know, all these different people involved in the creation. Oftentimes now, if you're, like, let's say you're a singer-songwriter and you want to go make a record, you're, you know, <coughs> your budget's very limited, mm -hmm. so you're probably just going to go hire one person. So are you going to hire a person who, who maybe is a, a really good engineer, um, but then has to go and, and hire the studio, has to hire the musicians, you know, has to hire all these people? Or you could go with this one guy who's a pretty good engineer, but he plays drums, plays guitar, plays keyboards, maybe he plays the violin. He plays all these instruments, at, you know, and he's, he's a, he understands theory, he understands harmony. So you, with this one guy, 
you can cover all these different jobs. Right. And that's a lot of what's happening now. Right. When I hire people, one of the first things I ask them is, do you play an instrument? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and if they don't, I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, I think there's a perception out there that musicians are, you know, lazy or they just want to go and play their instruments. But no, that gives me an understanding that that person understands music. And those are the people I want on my team. Because we're making music. Mm -hmm. We're making records. You got to know you the know. fundamentals. We're not, you know, we're not sitting there, you know, moving faders and, you know, that's part of it. But we have to understand why we're doing that. Mm -hmm. We have to understand, you know, what we're hearing. And so, yeah, it's, it's super important. Cool. Now, now, the more, you know, and then if you can also have some technical skills, that helps. If you understand electronics, if you understand computers, you know, understanding Excel, Word, all those programs. The more skills you have, the, the better chance you're going to have to succeed. Right. But at the top is the musical understanding. Okay, cool. So, so tell us a little bit about some of the bands you know. I've heard that you have an association with Hart, Nancy Wilson. Yeah, I've done a lot of work with Hart. In 2005, I was doing a series called uh, uh, Decades Rock Live on VH1. And uh, it was a great show. Basically, it was the, the, the producer <coughs> had these established artists, and he would bring younger artists on the show, and they would collaborate together. So the first show was Bonnie Raitt, and um, she had guests on that show, Nora Jones, mm -hmm. um, Allison Krauss, Keb Moe, and it was just a great show. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think it was very expensive to produce, and it, it, it ended up getting canceled eventually. But <clears throat> so we did Bonnie Raitt, then we did Cindy Lauper, and then the third act we did was Heart. And um, I ended up I ended up working with with Nancy, and um, we just really hit it off. You know, she really liked the way I made her stuff sound, and um, so I've been working with them ever since. Now, I've heard that she has a Hannah Dustin connection and a Haverhill connection. She does. Uh, I, was I was in the studio with her one time, and we were having dinner out in the kitchen. And um, her friend Julie is from Massachusetts, and, and Julie and I were talking about Massachusetts. And, um, and then Nancy said, so where are you from? And I said, oh, I'm from this town up on the North Shore called Haverhill. And Nancy went, Haverhill? Hannah Dustin? And I, I was like, what? <laughs> She said, yeah, we're, we're direct descendants of Hannah Dustin. Wow. Yeah. So Nancy and Anne's mom is a, is a Dustin. Mm -hmm. So they are directly descended from Hannah Dustin. That's awesome. Yeah. And Anne's, Anne's son is actually named Dustin. Um, <laughs> did she name him after Hannah Dustin? She did. Wow. Well, or our, our, her mom's maiden mm -hmm. name, yep. basically. Yep. And Nancy's actually been here to Haverhill. Wow. Yeah, and she, she spent a day going to the library, and um, if you read their autobiography, there's a picture of uh, Nancy with her axe, her guitar, next to the Hannah Dustin statue down in really? GAR Park. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Have you ever run into any other Haverhill connections out there, Massachusetts connections? Or? Uh, well, of course, there's Rob Zombie, mm -hmm. um, who uh, I've actually, I haven't, I haven't worked with him. I worked with his brother the, in the, the Power Man 5000 group. Mm -hmm. um, at Sony, we did, a, we did a radio tour with them. Um, interestingly enough, my aunt, Ruth Cochran, was Rob Zombie's first grade teacher. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, haven't, I haven't really crossed paths with him. Okay. As far as any other Haverhill connections, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I, think that, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 3,000 miles away, you're a long way out. Yeah. 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 So and of course, uh, you know Tom. <coughs> Tom Bergeron's from uh, from yep. Haverhill. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever cross paths with him? Uh, I, I, well, uh, interestingly enough, Hart was on his show um, last year, and I, I mixed the, but I haven't crossed paths with him, mm -hmm. which I'm surprised because I'm good friends with his sister Maureen. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. And and of course Tom and I both went to St. Joseph's. Right. Yeah, but for whatever reason, I haven't, you know. Right. Just haven't seen right. him. Right. Yeah. I'm sure I will at some point. 
So what was really your inspiration for getting into the music business? I mean, when you were a kid, you know, were you here in Haverhill, sitting in your bedroom, listening to music? Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, I got, I got bit by the music bug. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I had the stereo with, you know, all the records, and I just loved it, yeah. you know. Were you playing instruments from a young age? Well, I started playing guitar when I was 10. Wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Did you play any other instruments? I play bass, little piano, drums, bass. you know. Yeah. I play, I play enough of everything to, you know. Right. Yeah. Helps you understand it when you're actually Yeah, and, and <clears throat> you know, nowadays with the, the tools we have with, with Pro Tools and Logic, we can create quite a bit mm -hmm. on our own, mm -hmm. um, which is a blessing and a curse because I think, I think some of the collaborative elements of music are missing now. You know, a lot of it is just individual beat makers and producers working on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we miss that, you know, that experience of people getting in a room and just, you know, banging it out. Right. I don't think there's enough of that going on right, right. now. I think, I think the music, I think a lot of the newer music is kind of stale. Um, and uh, I hope, I hope we go back to more of a collaborative mm -hmm. element to the, to the music. Right. How else has the music industry changed, other than being a little bit less collaborative than it used to be? Um, well, you know, obviously the, uh, the, 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 the renum remuneration is significantly less than it used to be, mm -hmm. you know, so we've, we've had a real hard time getting paid, both, uh, you know, as a record label, as a professional. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know the, the shows that I mix, my budgets are a third of what they were less than 10 years wow. ago. Yeah. Wow. And that, that's due to two, two, well, it's really due to three things. The, 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 the finished product isn't selling the way it was. Right. Okay. Number two, there's a ubiquity of the tools. In other words, you know, a lot of things have gone onto the desktop. So before, if I was going to mix a 5.1 surround, I had to go into a big studio, you know, at, yeah. at fifteen hundred dollars a day. Mm -hmm. I needed that big studio. I needed the the console. Now we can do so much what they call in the box. Yep. In the computer. Yep. We don't need that big room. So what that's done is that's kind of democratized the uh, ability of people to do it. And and then that brings to the third thing that these recording schools have churned out so many people into this trade that there's just uh, um, a dilution of the workforce. Yep. And, yep. and there's so many people, and you're competing against them. And they may not be as professional as you, they may not be able to do the job as well as you, but if, if, you're, a, if you're the guy writing the check, and someone over here is gonna do it for 1500, and this other person over here is gonna do it for 5000, you're going to think really hard about writing that $1,500 check instead of the $5,000 check. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's you know, going on mm -hmm. a lot now. Um, so, Peter, I was just going to say quickly, tell us about some of your future plans, what you have coming up. Um, one of the things, I, I have a record label, Spin Move Records, um, which, which we've put out a number of releases. And we're, we're starting a, a film and TV library that we're very excited about. Yeah, and, and what's different about our film and TV library is we, we take real artists and real songs and put them into this library. Like a lot of libraries are built on, you know, just guys will like, well, we need, you know, we need 10 happy songs. Mm -hmm. And they'll just go into their studio and write 10 happy songs. But what I'm looking for, I'm looking for the guy who wrote that happy song because he was genuinely happy. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're, we're aggregating songs from real artists into this library. And, and I believe like, um, I have the saying, you never know where the gold is gonna come from. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's amazing music that's out there. I've even, you know, have friends here in Haverhill that I'm gonna put some of this music into this library. You know, cause these are, these are people that they were passionate about music. They made great songs. They, they, they put a lot of effort into it, and you know, maybe it, they didn't get the right connections, it didn't sell.
So now we can take those songs, we can put it into this library, and we can see if we can have another life for right. these properties. Get them some exposure. Yeah, yeah well, and money, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of money in, in uh, TV, <coughs> TV, movies, advertising, you know. And the cool thing about the, the library is you can, you can go in there and search by genre, you can search by, by mood, you can search by tempo. So if you're a music supervisor, you can go into this library and you can, you know, if you're looking for a sad, slow song, you type in sad, slow, and boom, the songs will, will come up. Oh, yeah. So I'm excited about that. We're also excited about our um, YouTube multi-channel network, which is the Spin Move Network. Um, a multi-channel network is a network within YouTube that allows you to aggregate other channels. We've been in the YouTube space for about eight years, and... Uh, it's a very exciting space to be in right now. And uh, one, one thing that's cool about the business right now is we're finding more and more ways to monetize our properties. You know, whether it be on Spotify, whether it be on iTunes, whether it be on YouTube. It's really become a business of pennies. You know, and the more pennies you can aggregate, the more successful you can be. And uh, we just love YouTube. We think, it's, we think YouTube is the new radio. Mm -hmm. Like back in the 50s, uh, a label like, or the 60s, a label like Motown would go in the studio, they would cut a record, and they would print up, you know, 545s. They would give it to all their radio stations. The DJs would put it on late at night, and if the phone rang, they knew they had something. And if it didn't, they went on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Well, with YouTube, you can, you can seed a lot of properties into the marketplace. And if you start to get the views, then you know you have something there. Right. And then you can start putting inertia behind that property. Right. And, and blow it up. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so the Spin Move Network, spinmovenetwork.com, spinmoverecords.com, those are two um, things that I'm working on and very excited about. I feel, I feel we have the, one of the best brands in the business. I think Spin Move is just a great brand, you know, when it comes to music. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's a big focus for me right now. So let's say you're a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. You have, let's say you have 20,000 subscribers. Mm -hmm. What we can do is go in there and help you monetize your content. Okay. But then we can also provide you with the ability to in improve your content. And we also have a lot of channel partners that we can, we can cl make collaborations. So we can help you to grow your audience, expand your audience. And the other, the other beneficial thing is that we can, um, we can claim videos across the entire YouTube platform. So it's very, it's very powerful. That's amazing. It sounds like yeah. a really interesting tool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. You've got an amazing story. It was incredible. And I'm Lindsay Paris for Across the Universe. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.